thank you that you would light a fire. That you would light a fire. God, I thank you that tonight you've removed trash that smolders our fire. Because the fire of God never changes. He never changes. He's always burning. He's always burning. And we need trash removal so that our fires can burn clean. So that we can have a pure flame. So that we can have a clean flame. So that we can burn with the brightness of His glory. So that the world would come to the feet of Jesus. So that they would bow now rather than be forced later. Do you understand that one day every knee is going to bow. It would be better if they saw something in our life that they wanted now. That they would bow willingly now than be forced to bow later. I would hate to stand before my King and if not be able to live to the fullness of what He's created me to be. So every day I wake up with the very thing. Every day I wake up with a burning passion to represent my King. Every day, everywhere I go, that is for everyone, all of us. I promise this. I promise a flame. I promise a burning in your chest tonight. I promise that your heart will burn. And I promise change. Change. Real change. Because what I see, what I see here is hunger. (laughs) Don't ever let your hunger go away. You can't do anything with people that aren't hungry. But man, hunger moves the heart of God. We were talking about it earlier today. We were talking about the wedding at Cana with Mary. That, that Mary, that we were talking about her last words. I was talking about, I talked to a lot of people that are in Catholicism. And I watched them come to Jesus just to get born again. And I say the last thing that Mary ever said was do whatever Jesus says. But where it came out of is that Mary was at this wedding and they ran out of wine and Jesus is there and she knows, I mean she of all people, she knows that He's the Christ. I mean, Gabriel said, and nobody went into Mary. Mary got pregnant by God. Of all people, she knows. She knows that He's the Christ, but nothing yet, nothing yet, nothing yet, nothing yet, nothing yet. She lived with nothing yet for 30 years, man. And she couldn't handle it anymore. She says to Jesus, they ran out of wine. And Jesus says, what does it have to do with me? My time has not yet come. Which means that when Jesus said that, He only spoke what the Father said. So the Father told Him, it's not your time. But Mary can't handle it. She turns to the servants and she says, do whatever Jesus tells you. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't in frustration, but I'm pretty sure it was in hunger. Not just thirst for wine, but hunger for Him. So Jesus turns and apparently the Father's heart changed. Not changed, but Mary pulled into her day. Listen, Mary pulled into her day what was reserved for another. It wasn't for that day because Jesus said, it's not my time. And he only said what the Father was saying. But when Mary turned and said, do whatever Jesus says, something happened. And God said, it's time. And I'm telling you that you can pull into your day today what might be reserved for another. You can pull into your day what might be reserved for another. But it's going to take the hunger of your heart to draw on heaven. Because you can have as much of God as you want. We can have as much of God as we want. He's holding nothing back. People are praying for a move of God. I get it. Why don't you just be the move? Why don't we be who Jesus says we are? Why would I pray for revival? Why don't I just be one? I have traveled with Bunky, and Bunky says, I don't like the word revival because God's not dead. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. What I believe we're on the brink of is a awakening, a massive awakening. Massive, massive. And it's the hunger of people, because all, everywhere I travel, the hunger of people, where they normally weren't, all of a sudden, overnight, oh, it's hunger. We can have as much of God as we want. Amen? Amen. I'm going to have them roll that video real quick, and I'm going to come out and pour my heart out, okay? Thank you so much, guys. Amazing. Awesome. 
let's just watch this little, do you have it? I, I didn't tell anybody. You guys. It's time that we stop being ugly. I am going to drive a sword deep into your heart. Because I'm telling you, this thing is easy. Our mission statement of the gospel is to become love. So that wherever we walk, people want what we have. We so love the world that we give. What do you give? Everything that you are, you give. You don't hold anything back. Come on, man. You don't have the right to have a bad day. Don't, well, you don't know what I've been through. Man, you don't know what he went through to give you his life. Man, what is it worth to trade your life? Why would you want to hold on to something that's crushed? What if you were so possessed by God that it didn't matter what people said about you? God has given you dominion by His Spirit that every place the sole of your foot treads, it's yours. God grabbed your heart, not for you to be bound by the fear of man anymore, but for you to be possessed by the love of God. And if God is for you, who cares who's against you? here for you you're here for him you abide in him you flow with him you move with him learn your identity who you are as a son stop being manipulated by lies and dominated by hell just surrender say you know what God I didn't get it now I do God I want this and God says that I can work with that Whoa. and you don't have to say well God what do you want me to do today just do it well, God, where do you want me to go? Just go! Well, God, who should I pray for? Everybody! Persecution's not here, but it's coming! And if you can't rise up now, in the midst of nothing, you'll never be able to stand in the midst of persecution. We're so used to being comfortable. We're so used to just staying inside our comfort zone. Holy Spirit has called the comforter because he knew that you were going to be uncomfortable to step into this thing. Rise up and be the bride. Be a passionate warrior that God created you to be so you can burn with fire and the world can watch you burn. Why would you hide this thing? Why would you be a basket-headed Christian? Why would you put this thing underneath of something? It is meant to shine so that your whole house will be lit. It's meant to shine so that your city can be lit by one person. Everywhere you go, you're a conduit for God's grace, for His glory, for His mercy, for His compassion. You're a conduit for His fire to flow through, to touch the world around you. All you've got to do is say, yes, I want this, God. That's it. All you've got to do is say, I'm in. All that's required is that you're sick and tired of not having this happen in your life. And God says, you know what? If you're sick and tired of it, I want to fill you with me. When you're on the earth, not to represent you. God, by mercy and grace, mercy woke you up today to give you one more day to manifest Him and not you. Come on, guys. This thing's real. Rise up. Be the bride. Be passionate about something. Give your life. Stop holding on to you. What are we doing? What are we doing with this? Come on, all you got to do is say, I want it. That's it. There's no like, there's no secret except the mystery and it's been revealed. The mystery is Christ in us, the hope of glory. destroy hell for a living yeah oh. mm. remember when I said earlier I don't really I rarely feel God touching me I, I, right now he's hugging me man 
really, I can feel them all around me. It's crazy. I live my life. I've lived for nine years in, in Christ without hardly feeling anything. I don't have to feel. I know. He didn't say live by feelings. If they come, that's awesome. But we are not supposed to live by feelings. To be very careful, the wisdom of the world is both sensual and demonic. It's full of self-seeking and envy and everything evil is in there. And feelings are part of that. And if you have to feel God to know He's with you, if you don't feel Him when you leave, you'll think He left you. So people are like, oh, I feel this. Wow, this is awesome. And then you walk away and then He's not there anymore. And I've seen so many people be deceived in that area. Pray for me that I feel God. Absolutely not. I'll pray for you that you know God. You need to know Him in your heart. You need to know Him in your soul. You need to know because the Word tells you so. You need that thing so rock solid in here that no lie can enter into this thing. There's a no vacancy sign on your forehead because Holy Spirit has sealed you with truth. I am in love with Jesus and everywhere I go I'm in love with Jesus. No matter how my day goes, I'm in love with Jesus. My day doesn't determine my love. My experiences don't determine my love. My love determines my experiences. When I face stuff, when I face hard stuff, I face them head on. I don't go around them, I go right through them. Why? Because my king lives in me. There is no fear in love and the perfect love of God casts out all fear and God didn't give us a spirit of fear but he gave us a spirit of love, power and a sound mind but without the sound mind you can kind of walk in love but you'll be offended. And without the sound mind you can walk in power and gain your, who you are through your power and it's not your power that determines who you are. And you'll use your authority twistedly to make yourself feel better and all of a sudden it's a whack day man. And you've gained who you are through the miracles that you do. And that would be sad to stand before God one day. Have gained who you are through the prophetic, through your miracles, through casting out demons. Stand before God and say, Lord, didn't we do this? And didn't we do this? And didn't we do this? And Him say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. You practicers practicers of lawlessness. I'm not saying don't do the miracles, but I'm saying there is a place in Christ that we can live that is so powerful that there's no compromise at all inside of here. There's no gain for attention here. There's no need for a limelight. Because I am the light, so I don't need a limelight. I am the light of the world. Jesus said that. He didn't say this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That sounds good, but that's not true. He said, I'm the light of the world, the city on a hill, a light that lights up his own house. That means that when I go into my house and it's dark, when I show up, it's light. That means if nobody believes around me, wherever I go, they will because I know God. And they'll come to know God because I know God. And I will not allow what they don't see to determine what I do see. And I'll never allow their sin against me to produce sin within me. God saved me from me. He set me free from me so that I can be free from you. So that no matter what you say to me, I love you unconditionally, no strings attached, nothing you have to do to earn my love. Because I just love you because I love God. But I only love God because He first loved me. Lots of people think that you came to God. Well, that's wrong. That's not how it happens. God came to you. No one comes to Christ. No one comes to Jesus unless the Father draws Him. So no matter how you come, it's always the Father. Always, man. He is in it. It's crazy. I look at the Bible. I'm, I'm, I search the scriptures to not to talk myself approved. I study the scriptures to show myself approved. I don't study them to talk myself approved. I don't study them to, to preach a good sermon. I've never studied my Bible to teach the word. And, and I'm not saying that you, you have to. I'm, I, I study my Bible constantly. But I want that thing so in me that I've become it. And I teach out of what he's made me become. Because the word has been made flesh in my life. Does it make sense? I got a lot of stuff on my heart, and I'm trying not to look at your clock. But I want to honor you, and if you get done before I do, please go. Listen, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do tonight. I'm going to share my testimony. I'm going to share it, and I'm going to share where I came out of. Who did not hear my testimony? Who has no idea where I come out of? Okay, it's very necessary. Because I have to share that first or you'll think like, well, let me share it. 
first of all, when I come up on stage, a lot of places, I, I know that you guys knew I was coming. I saw my face on your thing out there in the light, which was the craziest thing. A lot of times I go to churches, the pastors invite me. I sit in the back. I don't even sit in the front. Not that I don't mind the I don't want the front. I sit in the back, and a lot of times people are praying for me to get saved. <clears throat> And then when I get the microphone, they're like. You have no idea how many places I've been where people come up to me afterwards and repent. I don't need that. But if you think that with your own heart, you need that. I don't need you to say you're sorry to me. I'm good. I love you. But if you need your conscience cleared, by all means, do it all the time. Don't ever let anything set in there. Your conscience is the most valuable thing that we have. Keeping this thing pure and unviolated. Because then nothing, not anything goes. Listen, the more we sear our conscience, the more stuff that we allow, the more lines we cross. And all of a sudden we call evil good and good evil. And the Bible talks about it. It says in the last days they'll call good evil and evil good. And I, I, I promise you, man, there's this new pastor was talking about this morning he's talking about this grace doctrine it's from hell man (laughs) oh my gosh I have a burning desire to dismantle that thing where people think that grace is a license to do whatever you want my God grace is God's willingness to forgive me grace is God's willingness to empower me Grace is God's willingness to come and make His home inside of me so that I could represent Him well. And me using grace to sin would not be representing Him well. It would be representing hell, which isn't grace. It's disgrace. And I travel all over the world and I get to see these people, man. I get to, I get to run into them. Hey, bro, you're all about grace, right? Well, yeah, it's grace through faith. Well, yeah, 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 me too. Man, listen, let me tell you something. <clears throat> Boy, help me, Jesus. I have a burning desire in my heart, man. It's burning right now. Because we can do this thing. We don't need to get sidetracked. We don't need to see this legalism bound people so hard that when they catch the grace thing, the pendulum swings totally to the other side. And we, we, we totally react to error because legalism is error because without the Holy Spirit, you, you can't do, you can't walk out the Word without the Holy Ghost. He's the one that wrote the Bible. You can't do it unless He's there. So what happens is people are so bound in that thing and then they hear the grace message that's just grace. And then all of a sudden, the pendulum swings the whole way and they react to error. It's like driving down the road, a deer coming out in front of you and instead of just swerving to miss it, you swerve and hit a tree way far away from where you could have missed the deer. You, you, you react to error. We can't afford to be swayed by that twisted wind of doctrine. We can't. We have to be swayed by His love, by His heart, by His beauty. We have to come back to the original plan, which is the desire of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus had the sevenfold Spirit of God, but His number one desire was the fear of the Lord. It's everything. The fear of the Lord is simply loving what God loves and despising what He despises. It's being so in love with God and reverential all of God that you couldn't dare do that now that you have this. But it's through relationship that that thing gets cultivated. And all of a sudden God points out things that need to go because he's a gardener and he prunes and he clips and he trims. And he gets all this stuff out that needs to go. And then he expects obedience. If God speaks to you with truth, whatever truth calls you to, grace empowers you to walk out. But without grace, truth is hard. Jesus says grace and truth came through Jesus. Grace and truth. So it was both. It was a combination. Because without grace, truth is impossible. Biblical truth. You look at the Beatitudes and you read those things and you read them. It is impossible for you to be blessed when you're persecuted. It's impossible. Because if you have to feel blessed when you're persecuted, that's twisted. But if you have to know that you can appreciate the reality of the suffering that's been granted to you. The disciples got whooped and bleeding from their backs and they counted it a privilege. A privilege to be whooped for their king. And we're, we get weirded out when we tell somebody Jesus loves them and they snap at us. Really? 
People say, well, you got a spirit of rejection. I don't find that in my Bible. It's not in there, guys. We've created it. The devil's rejected. So he wants to recreate him in you. See, he can't come up into heaven and dethrone God. He tried that. It didn't work. And God put him here, and then he created us to thump him. Really. God gets good pleasure out of watching his kids stomp hell for a living. He does. He loves it. It's so much more fun to stomp hell than to be manipulated by it. But in order to not be manipulated by it, we have to understand who the shepherd is. And we have to recognize the shepherd's voice. And God only speaks through his word. Only. So without having that as my guard in here, as truth. See, people have tried to like rebuke the devil. I command you, get behind me, get behind me, get behind me. Because a lie comes, you know. How many times have we ever had, you know, you shouldn't have done that from 10 years ago, whatever, that whisper thing. That thing is so done. But if the devil can get you to turn and spin and rebuke him, all he wants you to do is rebuke him. I command you, get behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. God never told you to do that. Ever. He told you to put truth in here. So that when Satan comes and whispers, he's exposed. Why would I rebuke him and command him to get behind me when he already is? The truth of God is my guard, is my, is my stance. The reality of the salvation of the soul, Peter says, is the finishing of your faith. And when he says the salvation of your soul, it looks like it means to be beamed up out of here. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the salvation of your mind, your will, your emotions. This thing being sanctified. This thing being set free. Your soul being so transformed by the renewing of it. That when the lies come, they're exposed. You don't have to rebuke a lie. What do you do? You take every thought captive to the obedience of the mind of Christ. So you put in God's thoughts so that when twisted thoughts come, you realize that that's not a voice inside that needs delivered. It's a voice out, try, outside trying to regain. I hope that makes sense, man. Okay. I've been a Christian for nine years. I was a pretty angry, hardcore drug addict, atheist bitter, mad, you wouldn't want to run into me, tell me about Christ. It was a bad day. Because see, I, I never saw anything in Christians that I wanted. If people can't see Christ in you, they don't want you have what you, what you say you have. They don't want, they, the world's not looking for a confession from you. The world's looking for the real deal. And a confession without a life lived is just empty. It's just words, man. No, it's amazing. It says in James, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. There it is again. So I receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save my soul. And don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer. Don't just hear it, do it. Well, how can I do it? You become it. Then all of a sudden, you, the truth calls you to something. You step into it. You walk it out. And it becomes yours. And nobody can take it from you. So Jesus says this. Well, I've never seen it. Okay. Then you step in it. Now I have. Whoa. I've experienced the truth. And the devil says, well, that's not real. Well, it's too late. I promise. I don't understand why people can't see this. I, and I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. It's simple. We've complicated it. We've complicated the simplicity of the gospel. Jesus says, become like a child or you'll never, ever see it. You'll never enter in. Become like a child. Well, I'm, I've been in the church 50 years. You still, 50 years in, need to become like a child. You can't think that you got it all, man. You better be very careful. Because, man, I meet people all the time that tell me, oh, wow, you're new. Wow, you're, you're, you're on fire. How old are you in God? Remember a nurse tell me, I, I gave the example last night. Nurse went and prayed for somebody in the hospital, and they got healed. And I come out of the room, and she heard us praying. She goes, wow, how old are you in the Lord? I heard you praying. I said, I'm a year. She goes, oh, honey. You wait. You'll see. 
I've been a Christian for 35 years. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, you'll see. Well, you know, things and life and this and that. And I looked at her and I said, did Jesus change? I don't, wasn't trying to be arrogant. That's the truth. I wasn't being arrogant because the truth spoken in love is the reality of this thing. Because I can speak truth, but outside of love, and it'll hurt you. But I can speak truth in love, and it'll cut you deep and make you change. Solid gospel, man. Exciting. It's time to burn with a fire. It's time to blaze. It's time to light up your workplace. It's time to not be ashamed of this thing. And the mechanics that are working around you, they, they got this mouth on them. And you're a Christian. So the worst thing you could do is be silent. And I'm not telling you, I can't believe you're swearing, you're bad. You need to do this or you're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we need to be bold about what we say we believe, man. We need to be unashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe. You know the word believe? It's crazy means to be fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt well let me ask you are you fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to heaven okay that's the end result of a life lived now are you fully convinced that heaven got into you that's what I'm talking about because you can position yourself to get out of here and you can pray for Jesus' return and you can look at life and you can read your Bible and say, the world's getting worse. My family is mean. My boss is a jerk. I didn't get my parking place again. <laughs> People are angry. People are always doing my kids, this, that, the other thing. My gosh, my knee hurts. This is crazy. God, get me out of here. To heaven with me and to hell with the world. And that is not what Jesus told us to do. He said, guys, be of good cheer when you face tribulations. I have overcome the world. So if he overcame it, then why are we so threatened by it? I will not be afraid. I will not be threatened. I will lose my life for this gospel. I've already lost it. I've given it. Done. It's not about, God, do you want to use me? It's God, possess this man. So that everywhere I go, every town, every city, Every airplane remembers that there was a guy that was possessed by you on that plane. Oh man, I have so many testimonies to share. Let me share the beginning, sorry. <laughs> so at 11 and a half years old, my mom, my dad split up. They put me in a boy's home. So I grew up in a place called the Masonic Homes. They put me in there and mom told me I could come home at the end of the summer and she never got me so I stayed there for five and a half years I was angry I was bitter I, was, I would soothe myself with drugs and alcohol with whatever I can get a hold of anything I could get my hands on to make me feel better here so I was high my whole life I get out of there I joined the Marine Corps because my stepdad dared me to he said you'll never be a real man because real men are Marines I said I'll show you and I joined the Marines with an attitude problem not a good idea I went to boot camp I did really well because I mouthed off the whole time. I had an attitude. So I was the king of the quarter deck. If you're a Marine, you understand what I'm talking about. They couldn't break me at the end. I was a machine. I had been brainwashed. But my brain was washed by the wrong thing. It wasn't washed by blood. It was washed by conformity. Conforming. Don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. And I had been conformed into a machine. But that only lasted for a little while. So I went, I went after boot camp, I went home, went on leave, tell my mom, my mom was so proud of me, she's like, wow son, you've really changed, you're a different man, my stepdad, you're really changed, you're a real man now, congratulations son, that lasted for about 12 days, I went back to base and I realized these guys are partying, they're drinking, they're getting drunk and having a good time, I'm going to do that, done, a couple weeks later, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go home on leave. They said, no, I packed my stuff. I went anyway. Not a good idea. 
I went home, I stole a bunch of money in a drug deal, and I went out to Colorado. Got a job as a ski bum out there, fugitive. I got arrested a few months later. They put me in jail. I fight extradition. That didn't work. I get extradited across America. Get put back in the brig. They put me in military prison for a while. I get out. They tell me my orders are going to take a year and a half in order to clear. I can't wait that long. So I ran away again. So they came out and smart me went back to the same place they arrested me at before because I couldn't get over the skiing. (laughs) So they brought me back across America again, put me in the brig. I ended up getting out after a few months. Then they kicked me out, gave me a bad conduct discharge. That doesn't look good on your record, so that's how I started my life out. I went and couldn't get jobs, so I got a sales job and got another sales job, got another one. I'm working for commission, so it didn't matter. I could just work commission anywhere. You know, it's not a guaranteed paycheck, so you are what you sell. That's what you get paid. So I'm going job, 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 job. Finally, I landed this one job, and this guy's like, hey, we have this girl we want to introduce you to. You know, she's, she has a, you know, she, she has this and this and this. And I'm like, all right, cool. So we have a blind date. I end up schmoozing her, tricking her into thinking I'm some stallion. Because I was a great liar. I was just like the father of lies. That's why it's so dangerous for a Christian to lie. And the problem is, is they don't want to really do a big lie. They call these little white lies. Little white lies are the same. A lie is a lie is a lie is a lie. It doesn't matter how small it is. It's the same thing. And Satan's the father of lies. God forbid that you manipulate the truth a little bit and let your kids see that and then try to get them to be on fire for Jesus. It's the number one thing Jesus rebuked. He rebuked hypocrisy. (laughs) You hypocrites, he said. You strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. He said, you're outside of your cup. You think you're clean because of that. First clean the inside of the cup. And then the outside will be clean too. He said those things. It was crazy. Do you remember when he said, Woe to you Pharisees! You teachers of the law! You hypocrites! Heavy stuff, man. Intense. Matthew 23 is the most intense set, man. It's intense, man. Jesus, man. How long I've wanted to gather you. You know, Jesus says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. Hot or cold, choose one. He says, it's better to be cold than it is to be warm. He says, because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. A lot of people don't read that. They don't want to read that. There's a lot of things that a lot of, I've found in my travels that people don't want to read in the Bible. Because it, because it convicts them. Conviction is what we need. Because where the Holy Spirit convicts, grace comes to enable you to stand up under. But because we avoid conviction, we only read the stuff that makes us feel good. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. God knew that we were going to be very uncomfortable, so He said, I'm going to give that as one of His names. You're required to depend upon Him to walk this thing out. Christianity cannot be lived out except for relationship with Holy Spirit. Without Him, it's just a book. And the world thinks it's just a book anyway. Well, you know, it has a lot of contradictions. But the truth is, is that when you read it in the Holy Spirit, there's not one contradiction. It meshes together like an amazing puzzle that fits just like the temple that was built out there, brought in without a hammer. Sound of a hammer just went right together, man. Because God is perfect. So Jesus says hot or cold, and I studied that out, man. I said, God, this doesn't make any sense to me. Because my my thinking is that, like, at least people that are warm know about you. At least they go to church. He said, Todd, that's not what I mean. He said, you were ice cold, and then I switched you to hot, and all you do is burn. He said, but people that are warm, he said, Todd, they're a damage to the world around them. That's why it's so dangerous. Lukewarm is a damage to the world. Because we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. Because we quote a lot of scriptures, but don't walk them out. Because we don't believe that God wants to empower us. We say things like, I'm unworthy, I'm not worth it. Really? 
Listen very carefully. Satan's number one thing that he attacks Christians with is you're not worth it. You're worthless. Why? Because he's worthless. If I were to sell you a car and tell you I wanted you to give me $5,000 for it, but you knew that it was only worth 500 bucks, would you give it to me? No way. If you were house shopping, no matter how bad you needed a house, and I showed you a house and, and you, you walked through it and I told you I wanted a million five, and you knew it was worth 150,000, would you give it to me? No way. Well, here's my question. If in the world, the value of something is always determined by the price that's paid for it. And heaven went bankrupt to get you back. How dare you look in the mirror and say you're worthless. Come on, man. I know this makes sense because it's in your Bible. And it's alive in me, man. I'm a concordance. He loves me. I'm consumed with it. Since day one, I've been consumed with the love of God. He loves me. Nothing, nothing I had to do to earn it. Jesus paid the price for me to receive it. I believe it. I step in it. And I stand in it. And then he tells me I have two commandments. Whew, that's easy. It's either two or 613 and 10. And the 613 and 10, you have to walk it out in your own strength in your own wisdom and that's shot because the wisdom of the world is sensual, demonic full of envy, strife all that stuff every evil thing is there so you try to walk out the law with every evil thing there's no way because the law just it brings it up Jesus says there's two see when I fall in love with God and I love Him with all my heart my soul, my strength with everything I am whew, I can look in the mirror and love myself and if I can't do that I can't love you it'll be false it'll be fake love because I'll tell you I love you but I'll have secrets and stuff and I can't have fellowship with you the Bible says that walk in the light as he is in the light and then I have koinonia I have fellowship with you so if I'm clean and I'm clear in my heart and in my conscience and I stand before God and I'm in love with God and I love him with all my soul my mind is in love with what God told me to seek first and that's his kingdom his righteousness and all of a sudden I'm consumed here with that and then when I look at you I see your creative value because I love God when I look in the mirror I don't see yesterday I see today mercy woke me up and gave me another day to manifest Him I don't see a cost to this thing guys there's not really a cost to the gospel people say oh it'll cost you I hear that all the time man wow brother this will cost you you know what God's asking you you know what the price is Jesus paid it now watch here's the cost on your end all God's asking you to do is to give up something you were never created to be in the first place because He didn't create you for you. He created you for Him. So that's all God's asking you to give up. So what's the big deal? We love ourselves in the wrong way. See, when I look in the mirror, I see who God created and I can love what He made me to be because He made me in His image. He created me in His image. He created me to become love. And when I see who I am, I become love. God is love. Jesus was the visible image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15. He was the visible image of the invisible God. Come on, man. In Hebrews chapter 1, He was the express image of the Father. In John 14, He's talking to the guys. He's like, you know, I, I'm going away. And where I'm going, you can't come. Like, well... How are we going to know to get there? They're the, he's the best thing that ever happened to the disciples, man. To anybody, ever. He's like, I'm going away. Where are you? What? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm so glad that he didn't say, nobody comes to heaven except by me. We've made it that. And we've, we've bypassed an encounter with the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And if I don't realize when I get born again that God's my Father, I'll be headed to heaven. But I'll live like hell till I get there. 
and I will just make it in by the skin of my teeth and you don't have skin on your teeth so that's a bummer <laughs> it's not about just barely making it in man it's about being confident it's about having confidence now to approach the throne of grace in time of need and let me ask you something when's the last time you didn't need Jesus so why don't you just live there but you can't afford to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good you have to be heavenly minded so that you're earthly incredible I believe the times are changing and that the sons of this world are not going to be more shrewd than the sons of light because God wants to reveal his manifold wisdom to the principalities by the church he wants to reveal the reality of his wisdom through his bride and he wants them to be very petrified but, but instead of that, the bride is petrified. It's twisted, man. I meet so many people, and I, and I talk to them, how you doing? Well, you know. No, I don't. I promise. What are you trying to say, man? Well, what's going on? Well, you know, life, man. Stop it. My counseling sessions go different. I don't have time for that stuff, man. I'm not going to sit there and water down this gospel to make you feel good about your situation. I'm going to speak the truth in love and I'm going to watch you stand up in the midst of that and I'll come alongside of you but I will not pity you I will not keep you bound it's unholy compassion to keep somebody bound in that place oh woe is you no it's not woe is you woe is the devil God's looking for champions and when you said yes you became one it's just time we wake up and see who we were created to be Everywhere I go, I get to watch people burn, man. Light a fire in me. Don't you want to burn? Aren't you tired of being burnt out? Don't you just want to burn? Grace is the fuel that enables your motor to run. Holy Spirit is so amazing. He lets me see right where I dropped my testimony. Whew. Sorry. Are you getting anything out of this? It's provoking, man. And there's so many scripture up in here, it's just laced with it. Because without it, it's nothing. I can't afford to give you my opinion. I have to preach the truth. Preaching the gospel in the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. Preach the gospel in the Holy Ghost. Because He's the only one that makes it alive in you anyway. But he'll reveal it to you because our words can become, man, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, spirit and life. So as a believer, I partner with heaven. And when I speak, my words can become both spirit and life. That's not, that's not arrogance. That's confidence that I believe his word has been magnified above his name. And if I speak it and preach it out of who he's created me to be, it'll reproduce the same thing in you. Because I'm not preaching to you out of something that I'm just learning. I'm preaching to you out of my life, man. <clears throat> so they kick me out. I meet this girl. We end up moving in together. About a year and a half into our life, we end up, she has to be on medicine to have children because she can't get pregnant. So we go on fertility medicine and, and we end up having a daughter. And my day, the day my daughter was born, I was so happy and sad at the same time. Because I realized that I, I'm not a dad, man. I, I'm a drug addict. Full on, disruptive, destroying everything, stole from everybody. My girlfriend is petrified, I'm hooked on coke, twisted. Then all of a sudden it got way worse and she said, you know what? I'm done. I am not staying with you. I said, if you leave me, I'll kill you and kill whoever you're with. And then I'll kill myself. And I promise you that I had it all planned out, man. <laughs> you have no idea how many people think that way. I was jealous. I was rage, man. I was the guy that if you were in front of me, or if I was in front of you, and you beeped your horn in back of me at a light, I would get out, come back, get you to open the window, and knock you out in your seat. But that's just a little bit. I was very, very bad. Very, very bad very 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 bad very very bad 
My family, I was the black sheep. I was the black cloud. When I came, they all hid their wallets. I'm not kidding. My sales jobs, I would have jobs. I would go into the house and I would clean house. Can I use your bathroom? I clean out their medicine cabinet. Dude, I was a thief. Twisted, man. Whacked. So I ended up just tormented. Told her I'd kill her if she ever left. So she stayed with me. So in those nine years that I was with her, I had 30 jobs. I quit or got fired by every one of them. I never held a job. And she held the same job the whole time. So we were together for nine years. Nine years into it, seven and a half year old daughter, she ended up, I come home one night, she's gone. So I go and I'm like, I'm done. Finished. I know she's not with anybody, but I can't do this anymore. I mean, I was at the end. So I went and passed by a phone book right beside, I was going to write, I went to her stepdad's house to get a rifle because he had a bunch of guns. And I went and I opened a phone book and there was, and, and there was 586 churches in there. It flipped open to churches. Like I just broke it open. I didn't know who to call. I was on the way to the gun cabinet. I was going to write a letter and it was right beside the notepad and the pencil. And I looked and I took a marker out of that thing and I marked off this one church. And I went there. I don't even know why I was going. I had no idea. See, God was drawing me, but I had no clue. I was totally oblivious to it all. I went there. Some guy meets me at the door with the biggest smile on his face, man. How you doing, buddy? I'm like, what is wrong with you, man? <clears throat> so I go inside and I tell him I pour myself <laughs> the head pastor from the church that I went to was a graduate of Raymond. I met the associate pastor that day took me upstairs we sat down he shared the gospel with me I said man I did not come here to hear about Jesus he said this is a church I said why are you so happy man what's wrong with you I'm not kidding, man. His name was Dan Moeller. You can't get the smile off his face. Still today. It's crazy. And I told him my stuff. He goes, man, listen. 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 And I was like, what? You're not even listening to me. He said, I am. But what you're telling me isn't helping you. And he talked to me and he shared the gospel. And he goes, you, he didn't say invite Jesus into your heart. He said, you need to give him your life. It would be bad if I invited it in my heart and I left, held back my life. See, you're either for him or against him. You either gather or you scatter. <clears throat> remember this guy, remember Dan told me, he had a, there was this atheist, he had this dream. It was a legit dream, man. This guy has this dream and, and goes to sleep at night and all of a sudden he sees this huge field. <clears throat> and in this field there's a fence that goes right up the middle. And then on this fence, and in the middle of this field, there's a fence. And on one side is Jesus and all these people. And on the other side is the devil and all these people. And he can tell that it's Jesus. But see, you guys think maybe because of how TV has played him that he's got a pitchfork. That's not how he looks, man. He's attractive. He's seducing. It's different. And he could tell that it was darkness. So this guy, he gets up on this fence. He's standing there. All the people with Jesus disappear. All the people with the devil disappear. He's all by himself. And he's standing there on this fence. And everybody's gone. It's a real deal. And all of a sudden the devil comes back into the picture. And he looks at him and he goes, there you are. I was looking for you. And he says, hey, I didn't choose him. And I definitely didn't choose you. And he says, sure you did. The fence is mine. True story. The man woke up a Christian. <clears throat> so my life is hammered, man. So I'm like, whatever, fine. That's my, my acceptance of Jesus. Fine, whatever. I don't want my life anyway. I had no idea what I was getting into. None, not a clue. Something brought me to that church, man. So I said, you know, and I prayed and I asked him to take my life. I said, God, if you're real, you show me you're real, I'll live for you. Simple as that. I went home. I called my girlfriend. I said, you need to come home. My daughter got on the phone with me. 
because my girlfriend didn't want to talk to me. I said, you need to tell mommy she needs to come home. She goes, daddy, mommy's not coming home. I said, you need to tell mommy that daddy found God. My daughter said, what's he like, dad? I said, I don't know, but I saw somebody that did. So she came home. Girlfriend's an atheist, man. No Christianity in either of our families, the whole way back. The whole way down the line. That's amazing, because now I get to leave an inheritance to a thousand generations because of the righteousness of my life. I get to start and I get to leave a legacy. I get to begin it. I get to start it. Mm, what a privilege, man. People say, well, you're, I'm not a fifth generation pastor. I say, no, no, no. I'm the first in my line. And every bit in my line the whole way down is going to be blessed and they're going to carry this thing. And I'm not going to let it fizzle out with the next generation. They're going to carry it, carry it, carry it, carry it, carry it. Glory. <clears throat> so I, they're home. Went to put my daughter to bed. She goes, Daddy, I am so glad. I said, Honey, I love you. And I cried, held her. About an hour and a half later, I'm out buying crack. First night. Imagine that. See, a confession is a confession. It's the truth that sets you free. We can't afford to just say, I love Jesus, and never get into the Word. Listen to me. And you can't afford to get into the Word without the love of Jesus. If you read that Bible to apply principle, look, I, I talk to lots of people, man. They have promises on their refrigerator. And they try to apply them as formula. But that's not how we obtain promises. All of His promises are yes and in Him. Amen. Which means that in order for me to have promises, I need to be in Him or they're not going to take effect in my life. But we've tried to apply them as theory. We've tried to apply them as formula. We've tried, this is my promise, this is my promise. We've quoted them. This is my promise, this is my promise. Outside of relationship and nothing happens. We have to be in Him because that's what He created us to be. In Him. Him in us, us in Him. One. Does that make sense? Are you guys all right? Okay. So for the next five and a half months, I damaged, 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 damaged. Four or five times a week, I'm out. I would call in the morning. I would talk to Dan. I would say, dude, I did it again, man. You know what he never told me? He never said, well, Todd, the reason why you're doing this is because you have a chemical imbalance and your serotonin levels are this. And you need to follow 12 steps in order to keep yourself okay. I've been through that stuff, man. This is the one-step program, guys. Resistance of the devil is a one-step program. It's submit to God and the devil's resistant. It's not submit to God and fight the devil. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Why does he flee? Because you're submitted to God. He doesn't flee when you command him to get away from you. He likes that. Then he gets Christians frustrated, worried, terrified, and they live in fear. Because the devil keeps saying, so what? Stop listening to him. Learn and understand the shepherd's voice. And then that other voice that comes is a stranger's. And you'll just follow the command of Jesus. A stranger's they will not follow. It's the voice of truth. This is good stuff. It keeps me alive makes my motor run. I wake up in the morning with three hours of sleep. Whoa. Another day, Jesus. Thank you. Really. I wake up, oh my God, really? Thank you. Every day. Every day. No matter what I face, I wake up the same way every day. Doesn't matter what I'm in front of. Doesn't matter what trial. Trials are there to help me with my faith. Trials are not there. They're there to derail me because the devil wants to derail me. But trials are there for, to purify my faith. So that I can increase in faith. You cannot consider it a joy to face a trial if you're not in him when you're in them. But when you're in him and you're in them, he will crush that stuff. Because you will see who you are in there. Guys, there is no growth in Christian maturity except through the trial. The trial produces patience. 
Patience produces character, and character produces hope, and hope doesn't disappoint. But so many times we beg God to get us out of the trial because we can't handle it anymore. And our perseverance is thrown out the way. How many people I talk to that like, they're like, oh man, man, patience is hard for me. Man, patience isn't hard. The reality of patience, when I talk to somebody and they say, look, if we had a conference, okay, if we called it the Patience Conference, guaranteed not many people signing up for that bad boy. People don't even pray for patience because they get people slow in front of their cars. I didn't get to work. Leave earlier. I don't have patience. They're, they're getting on my nerves. You're not supposed to have any. Attitudes are, are just, should be finished. There ought to be something different about the Christian. There ought to be something different about the man or woman of God. The people around us go, oh my gosh, what is this that you have? What is? Man, people at your workplace should say, what is this hope that you have? Because I'm really struggling, man. Could you help me with the hope that you have? Because I need to understand it. It's scripture. It's 1 Peter 3.15. Be ready to give an account with fear, trembling. To give an account when people ask you about the hope that's in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When people say that they don't have patience, it just means that they don't have love. Because the first thing that love is, is patience. It's the truth. I'm not pointing the finger at you. But if the shoe fits, take them off. <laughs> That's good. If the shoe fits, take them off. Don't wear it, man. It's not yours. Put on the shoes that Jesus says to wear. The gospel shod with peace. So my life was whacked. So check this out. When I was in the world, before Christ came in, I had this band. And it was like this heavy rock band. And we had it going on. Right? And then five and a half months, that, that day when I, came, when I came home, I had band practice. And them guys come over. We're partiers, man. And they came over to my house. I said, guys, man, check this out. They're like, what? I go, man, I met Jesus, man. They were like, shut the blank up. Promise. It wasn't pretty. I said, man, no, I'm telling you, he's real, man. Give me a hit. I'm promise. I had no idea. Come on, man. Come on, man. Let's party, man. I'm telling you, man, God is real, bro. All stoned. I'm telling you, man. First night of band practice, the guys were like, look, dude, stop talking about Jesus, okay? He's not real, and we don't want to hear it. They had band practice in my house, in my basement, at this dungeon we practice in. I'm like, come on, man, I'm telling you the truth. Man, we're out. We had a band that was together for three years, and they took all their stuff, and they left. One guy stayed. He was my best friend. His name was Bobby. He didn't believe in Jesus, but he was passive, chill, guitarist that was like Joe Satriani. He was like amazing. Self-taught. Brilliant. I mean a gift. A gift. And he said, look dude, he goes, I don't believe in Jesus man, okay? But I believe in you bro, okay? You are what you make yourself, man. He goes, you got problems. He goes, but I'm here for you. Now listen. <laughs> he said, you got problems, but I'm here for you. And I said, man, I said, cool man cool. Well, Jesus is real, man. I'm telling you. So we partied hard. Problem, I would be upstairs. I would be raging on my girlfriend, raging on my daughter, punching holes in the wall. Then I would come downstairs. He would hear it because we lived in a 1978 single wide trailer with a basement underneath. You hear everything. So I come downstairs. I open the door. Hey, man, how you doing, bro? Jesus loves you. Every time. Sometimes I wouldn't even show up for practice. He'd drive the whole way down an hour to get to my house. For practice, he'd be down jamming because I'm out on a crack binge. 
he w- I wouldn't even show up. So man, this went on five and a half months, five and a half months, twisted stuff. Then one night, I go out, I'm on a binge. I don't have any money. I go to the store, to, to the payphone to call my dealer to get him to, you know, front me some stuff because I don't have any money. Five and a half months as a Christian, as a confessing Christian, as one that incorporated Jesus in, but didn't have any clue about who I was. So all of a sudden, my, my girlfriend and my daughter are behind me in the car. Daddy, you promised. I said, I know. I'm sorry. And I really was sorry, but I couldn't stop it. I was trapped in this Roman 7 life. And I didn't want to, but I did it anyway. And I knew I shouldn't, but I did it. And then when I was doing it, I knew I shouldn't be doing it. It's twisted. There was no relationship with Jesus. So I go and I said, all right, I got in the car and we pulled out and I lost him. <laughs> Went down the back streets, man. Went down to a street that I normally don't go in. Picked up some kid from New York City. I get him in my car. He's got a bunch of crack on him. I got about a quarter ounce of it in my hand. And I tell him, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say, Kenna, will be used against you in a court of law. And I read him his rights and I told him I was a cop. And I told him to get out of the car and put his hands on the hood. I pulled over. This kid is freaking out, man. It's like a 15-year-old kid from New York City. Big town, big city kid in a little city. Trying to move in and bring his stuff down. So as soon as he cleared the door, I hit the gas and he unloaded a 9 millimeter at me from 10 feet away. Boom, 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 boom! And a voice said, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? See, people say, well, Todd, what's wrong with you? This is what's wrong. I should be dead. And God didn't save me so that I could remain bound. He saved me so that I could represent Him. And He saved all of you the same way. I went and smoked all the crack as fast as I could and every hit I took, that voice kept coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back, wouldn't go away. I get home, I'm freaking out because I couldn't get high the whole night and that voice is ringing, it's tormenting me from the inside. I get out of my car, I take my flashlight, I look around, not one bullet has touched my vehicle. And I know that it's God. I went up to the door, my girlfriend said, I hate you, get out of my life. <laughs> my daughter, Daddy! And I left. So the next day, Dan helped me to get into, and, and Pastor Jack helped me to get into Teen Challenge. So it took three days, a bed opened up. But that day, I called my friend, my best friend in the whole world, man, Bobby. I said, hey, I said, dude, I said, check this out, man. I said, I was out the other night, or last night. I said, and I got shot at, man, by some guy. And I heard God speak to me. He said, Todd, listen. Haven't you shown by now that Jesus isn't real? You've been doing this thing for the last six months, man. Nothing's changed. I said, man, I'm telling you, he's real, man. He is real. Todd, he's not real. The guy was a bad shot. Promise. I said, no, I'm telling you. Listen, man, I made the decision to go to rehab. He goes, oh, dude, good for you, man. Bro, good for you. He was happy. Because I was messed up. And he listened to the torment from my family. He was a good guy. He never really did anything twisted. He, he was a good guy, man. I mean, by the standards of the world's good. You know what I'm saying? I mean, in, in himself, he was, a, he was a stay-at-home dad. He didn't have to work. They owned their property. They owned their house. His wife worked at, like, an uh, applesauce plant. And she made enough money just to pay the utilities. And they were happy. And he has two kids. One three and a half and one seven and a half. A girl, three and a half, and a boy, seven and a half. And he's a good dad, dude. He's there for his kids all the time. By the world standard of good. So I said, dude, so I, I'm leaving in two days, man. He goes, oh, wow, okay. Well, bro, I'll be here when you get back, man. I go, listen, there's a, there's, this is a different kind of rehab. This is a year. I'm going away for a year. He goes, what? I said, a year, man. He goes, all right, man, but you just get better, okay? You get better. I said, dude, I'm going to learn about Jesus. He 
He goes, listen, man, listen. He's, it's better that you would open your mind. And it would be better that you go in there realizing that Jesus isn't real. Let them help you, man. You need help. I'll be here for you when you get back. We'll jam. I said, cool, dude. Man, I love you so much. Can we hang before I go? He's like, he's like, there's no way. Betty has to work. I have to be with the kids. He goes, but listen. He goes, I'll be here when you get back. I said, Bobby, I said, one more thing. I can't write any letters. I'm not allowed to make any phone calls. He goes, why? I said, because I'm going to learn who Jesus is, man. He goes, man, you're going to learn about something that's not real. And you can't even call me. You can't write any letters. <sighs> All right, man. I love you, man. So two days later, I get picked up. My daughter is very, very sad that daddy's going away. And my girlfriend is very, very glad that I'm getting out of her life. I destroyed everything, man. Put us through bankruptcy, charged up all of our credit cards, ripped off her mom, ripped off her stepdad, ripped off, I ripped off everybody, man. Ripped off my grandma, my grandpa, my uncles, my aunts. My sisters, I ripped them all off. I stole from everybody. And, and I quit everything. So I go into this place. I'm up at Team Challenge. I go in there, and, and I had done this one-step program. I submitted to God. I took a step. And I said, you know what, God? If you're real. And I'm in there, and I have no idea how to read. I can't read. I've never read a book before in my life, ever. My whole life. 34 years I've never read a book because I just forget everything I read so I'm up there in a place that's going to teach you about the Bible and I can't read well good thing the Bible's not meant for my brain the, the word of God is meant for your heart because your heart can take you places your brain can never fit man and you can't afford to just plug this word into your brain because it's not what the mind one believes it's with a heart one believes under righteousness. The only place the brain has is to be renewed by the truth of the communication with the Holy Spirit and our spirit. So I'm up there two days in. Three days in, sorry. Three days in, I've submitted to God. I, for the first time in my life, I don't have attitude with authority. It's amazing what submission to God will do. I don't have any attitude with authority at all. And my whole life, I hated authority, man. I was my own authority. You don't tell me what to do. And in Team Challenge, they tell you what to do. <laughs> Big time. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Okay, sir. Go mop the floor. All right. No big deal. Something happened, man. So I'm up there, get a phone call in the office. Todd, get in here. Hurry up. So I get in there, and this one counselor's in there. He goes, it's your pastor, man. He goes, sit down. And the look on this guy's face wasn't good. And I said, what's wrong, man? He goes, just, you need to talk to your pastor, man. Just sit down, close the door. I'm like, oh my gosh, man. You know the look when someone's got really, really bad news? Well, he's about to tell me some really bad news. <laughs> and I said, is it my daughter? Tell me it's not my daughter. Is it my girlfriend? She hates me, but I don't want her to be hurt. He goes, my pastor, Pastor Dan, he goes, Todd, he goes, you got to promise me something. I said, what? He goes, you got to promise me that you won't leave. I said, what? He said, it's Bobby. I said, what happened? He goes, Bobby had a brain aneurysm. My best friend, man. Oh, my God. The one that stood by me when nobody would. And it rocked me to the core I mean it rocked me so bad I said no I didn't even know what a brain aneurysm was they told me he's in a coma and the doctors don't expect him to come out of it they don't expect him to live and I threw the phone down and I ran out of the room and I ran upstairs and, and I could have ran out the front door but I had already submitted to God thank God I ran up the stairs and I ran back to the prayer room because I gotta be alone my best friend is dying I don't have anything to give him. I didn't give him anything anyway when I thought I had something to give him. All I did was give him hypocrisy. So I go in the prayer room and this guy follows me in. 
And this is not the time to approach me. And I turn around and there's this kid in there. His name's Micah. And he is a fruit tester. He is the guy to get in your face all the time. And in the world, it would have been very ugly. He came up to me and he goes, right here in my face, he goes, it's not that bad, man. Whatever it is, it's not that bad. Deal with it. Listen. I screamed. No! And I hit the ground. And the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, hit me on the floor and knocked him back into the couch. And God rested upon me. And he said, you're not going anywhere. And Micah said, what is that? I said, I don't know, man. But I'm not angry. <laughs> God took away my anger. I leave the room. I go downstairs, talk to the counselor. He goes, what's up, man? I go, man, I just, something just happened, man. What was it? I said, I don't know, man. I said, but I like Micah now. He goes, something amazing happened to you. I said, I'm, I'm telling you that something happened to me. So I stayed in Teen Challenge. Two months into Teen Challenge. I've got, I, I've just started to read the Word. I mean, I've been reading it every day. I would wake up an hour earlier than anybody else, and I would open the Bible, and I would say, God, this has to get in here. I don't know how it's going to happen. I'm going to stay in it until you show me what it means. I am not going away. This is the only thing that's going to change my life. And I had enough common sense. Is that amazing? To know that that's the only thing that fixed me. And Dan told me, and Jack, he was word man, dude. Word, 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 word. He said, Todd, if you don't get your mind transformed, nothing changes. And Dan said, if you don't seek righteousness, you'll never know. So I just went after that word in the Bible. Righteousness, 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 righteousness. Redemption, redemption, redemption. Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. I never went away from that. It's been nine years. Ever. So I'm in there. All of a sudden, a scripture makes sense to me. It's in James. It says, if I lack wisdom, ask God. And I went, oh my God, that's it. I'm wisdomless. And I freaked out. All by myself in the prayer room, 5.30 in the morning. I don't have any wisdom. Oh my God, that's it. I am clueless. Thank you, Jesus. I promise. And it was like the lights came on, man. I admitted that I lack wisdom. And God said that He'll give it to me if I ask. But when I ask, I ask in faith. Because if you don't ask in faith, you're like a wave, the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Let that man receive nothing because he's double-minded. We can't afford to be double-minded. We're supposed to be one focused. Plan A, Jesus. Christ and Him crucified, resurrected. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So it started to make sense. I'm like, oh, and I'm devouring. I devoured the word before. Now I realize that what I had devoured before is coming alive inside of me. It's crazy, because I read the Bible every day. I had no idea what it, wa- what it meant. I, I, mean, I, I mean, nothing. Not a clue. Then all of a sudden, the things that I put in there are starting to regurgitate. They're coming up like, oh, it's only been two months, but I've been devouring it. And you know, it's nine years and I haven't stopped. I'm devouring it. I listen to it on my iPod all the time. I'll be working out. I listen to one chapter again, 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 again. I push replay, 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 replay. People in the gym think I got a problem with my hip. I do. I listen to the Word all the time. I'm on planes. I listen to the Word. I watch the Word. I listen to it. I eat it. I live in it. I eat it. I sleep it. I breathe it. Jesus said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. He wasn't just talking about communion. He's talking about his life. Devour it. It's all scriptural, man. It's solid. So I'm totally overwhelmed with this thing. And then two months into this thing, I walk across the street, Teen Challenge. I got, I got privileges to go across the street and sit on the park bench. I'm sorry I'm so long. Are you guys okay? Okay. You okay? 
You sure? I'm almost done. It is 12 o'clock. Just kidding. If you think that, you look like, whew, glad it's not 12. All right, we got time. <laughs> yeah. So my life is, is turning, and, and, and I'm starting to realize that who I am, my identity. And I'm sitting on this park bench across the road. I got privileges to go across to have a guitar. I don't know how to play it, but I'm just strumming the strings. And this homeless guy is pushing a shopping cart up Main Street. He's going up the walkway. And I yelled to him. I said, hey, man. <laughs> I said, Jesus loves you, man. Right? So he pushes the shopping cart off the path. He comes over to me. It's like from here to me. And he goes, I know how much he loves me, but do you know how much he loves you? The homeless guy. I'm like, tell me. <laughs> he's got a baseball cap on. He's got swim goggles on his head. He's got sneakers on his feet with flood army fatigues on. Pushing a shopping cart up Main Street. And he sat there and he preached about righteousness to me. The very thing that I'd been seeking. And he looked at me. And he told me something like this. He said, you have a demon in you, son. And he said, I'm going to pray for you, and this thing's going to leave you. He didn't even know where I was at. He didn't know I was at Team Challenge. He had no idea where I was. In the natural, I'm just sitting on a bench beside the Susquehanna River on a street that's straight. He sits there, and he goes, I'm praying for you. He prays for me. I don't feel anything. He prayed for me. He said, thank you for blessing me with your music. I didn't know how to play. I said, thank you, sir. He goes, all right. I said, hey, hey, hey. Why are, you, why are you pushing a shopping cart? He said, 20 years ago, the Lord told me to pick up my cross and follow Him. I sold everything I had, and I've been pushing the shopping cart across America, going from mission to mission, telling anybody who will listen to about my King. Sold out. Sold out, literally. I looked in the shopping cart, and it was full of Bibles. I'm like... I walked across the street in a daze. The guys were kind of making fun of me for talking to the homeless guy. And I, and I corrected him. And I said, guys, we're supposed to love people. How could you make fun of him like that? And my heart was, it was real. It wasn't just a point in the finger. It was real. Like it was love coming out of me. I turned around and looked and this guy disappeared. We don't even know where he went, man. I don't know. All of them freaked out. Oh my God. They all walked in the house. There was nowhere for him to go. It's a mile street. It's a straight, it's a, there's nowhere for him to go. There was a bank on the other side, straight down to the river. And I was like, okay, all right. Went upstairs, went to class, did my classes. That night I went to bed and I had this dream. I had had this demonic nightmares, these terrors the whole time I was in there. Every night. In the daytime, the enemy couldn't have me, but at night he would terrorize this man at night. I didn't see Job 33, 15. I didn't understand that stuff. I didn't know that in deep sleep when I slumber upon my bed that God wants to seal up instructions. I didn't get that stuff. But I do now. But I didn't have it then. So in my dream, I'm in a valley. And there's these steep walls. And there's nowhere for me to go. They're like cliffs. And there's this green grass that goes the whole way down. And it starts to shake. And I hear a voice say, Do not fear. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. In my dream. And I wake up. And it's time to wake up. It's like two minutes or one minute before my alarm's going to go off. I turn it off. I get my Bible. I go down to the prayer room by myself, like usual. No one's in there with me. I'm seeking God before anybody's looking. I wake up early and I spend my time with Jesus. Every day. Every day. Every day. I feed. Every day. I can't afford to not have that in my life. I can't afford to not have relationship in my life. I can't afford to be a good scripture quoter. I can't afford to just quote scriptures and throw them at people without understanding what it means. I can't afford to read the Bible and not understand my value. And I open my Bible, just flip it open, and it opens to Psalm 23. And I read, just reading, I never read it before. It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall. And I sat back and I went, that was you. I went through my day, same thing. Next night, 
same dream. Crazy. Went to my, went, woke up. God woke me up before my alarm. I went down to the prayer room again, opened it up. Same psalm. Same thing. Third night, there's a light that shines in my dream down this thing behind me, and I am petrified. I am afraid. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Go home. I had entered into Teen Challenge for a year, <clears throat> but Jesus told me to go home. And I and only I know whether that's true or not. So I wake up in the morning, I start packing my stuff in the trash bag, man. I'm out. The guys are like, what are you doing, man? I said, I'm going. Hey, man, Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. I said, I get it, but this wasn't Satan, man. I go downstairs and they freak out on me. And you know what? I can, I can honestly say that I've been a Christian for nine years and I've never been hurt by somebody. I've lived without offense for nine years. And people think it's so unattainable because we got issues. But Jesus canceled my lifetime subscription to issues. <laughs> Attitudes need to go, dude. What are you doing? Life is short. Leave a legacy. So I go downstairs and the counselors freak out on me. And this one guy that freaks, he's been through Teen Challenge four times. So he sees me leaving early just like he did three times. So he, I understand. And he is screaming at me, <laughs> spitting. I said, man, listen, oh, tears, it's Jesus, man, it's Jesus. He goes, man, get out on the front porch. Just get out of here before everybody else gets polluted. And, and I get it. And I wasn't hurt. I wasn't upset. How could I expect him to understand an encounter that he didn't have? So I walk outside with my stuff. I put it on the porch. They call my pastor. And Dan comes up. He gets there about 40 minutes later. He pulls up and he goes, hey, buddy. He goes, how you doing? I go, I'll be back. I'm going inside, okay? He goes inside. They scream and rage at him. I mean, flip out. Dan doesn't scream. He's in love with Jesus, man. He comes back out and he goes, come on, let's go. So I get in the truck. On the way home, he tells me every reason why I'm going to make it. He doesn't tell me what I have to watch out for. He's telling me all the reasons why I'm going to make it. And the reason is Jesus. So I go and we drive to my house. Because I have to say I'm sorry to my daughter. Because man, for the first time in my life, I realize what it's like. I have to tell my daughter that I'm going to give her a dad. <laughs> I've never been a dad. I don't know what it's like, but I had an encounter with God, my Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. Without an encounter with the love of the Father, we will live our life as an orphan. And Jesus said, don't fear. I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come. And the Holy Spirit that's with you will be in you. That's a promise. So when I said yes to God, I wasn't an orphan, but I need to know the love of my Father. So now I've experienced it. So now I can give it to my daughter. So we go to the house. And my daughter's there. She runs. She sees the truck pulling in. She runs out the porch, man. I said, hey, you. And I picked her up. She's seven and a half years old, man. I said to her, Daddy's so sorry for all the mess that I did, for all the times that I stole money and all this stuff. She goes, Daddy, stop. She goes, you're home. I said, no, listen, I'm out, but I'm not home. I can't live here, baby. I love you with all my heart. I'm going to be a dad that you've never seen before. I didn't know how to be a dad, but God's my father. I met him. He lives in me. Look at my eyes. Daddy, I love you. I love you too, baby. I said, listen, you need to hear me. And I've got her face and I'm talking to her. Daddy's sorry about all these things that I've done. Daddy, what things? All the times that mommy kept you up late at night. All the times. Daddy, what are you talking about? Listen to me. She's looking at me with a blank stare. With a smile on her face. And my girlfriend comes out of the house. And I step back and I said, I am so sorry for what I've done. I mean, I put us through bankruptcy, all that. I ripped off her whole family, everybody. She goes, I know you are. When you were gone, I gave my life to Jesus. 
for real. And I said, you kidding me? Oh my God, I can't live here. My conscience was so pure, it was so clean, I wasn't about to defile it. For the first time in my life, this thing was clean. It was clear. Blood had washed my conscience. And the kicker is my daughter, the reason why she said she didn't know what I was talking about is because God supernaturally, by blood, cleansed her conscience from every dead work that her father did. From the beginning, a sovereign mood of God, a sovereign move, boom, righteousness hit my kid at seven and a half. She had no memory, none. My girlfriend looks at me, she goes, you can't live here. I said, no, I can't. She goes, will you marry me? <laughs> What's there not to be happy about, guys? <laughs> I said, we need, we, we need to plan this, seriously. Yes, I, I love you. I looked at Dan, I said, we're gonna plan this out. He goes, nonsense. He said, do you love her? I said, yes, sir. He goes, well, I've been talking to her when you've been gone, and I know that she loves you. She's a brand new girl. You're a brand new man. We'll get you married on Sunday in between first and second service. <laughs> so we get married in between first and second service on Sunday. My daughter is so happy. My, my, my brand new bride is so happy. I'm so happy. Her mom's there. She is very angry. <laughs> I promise. She said to me, I cannot believe that she married you. She is throwing her life away. And I said, Mom, you'll, don't you call me Mom. And I said to her, you'll see. I'll show you. I can't expect her to understand. There's a walk that needs to back up my talk. Actually, if you don't talk, you just walk. It does better. Her stepdad is there. I said, man, I, I just want to say thanks for coming. Don't talk to me, you liar. You're a thief and a loser, and you don't fool me. In church, at my wedding, you don't fool me. You're a liar. I looked at him with tears, and I said, you'll see. I wasn't hurt at all. See, there's a difference between being hurt by people and hurting for people. See, God's not hurt by us. He hurts for us. Oh, that's powerful, man. I don't get hurt by people. They don't know what they're doing or they wouldn't do it. And if I get hurt by something that they didn't, they didn't know they shouldn't have done, if I get hurt by somebody in the church, which is common, somebody in the church hurts me, we say, well, they should have known better. Well, let me ask you this. They should have known better not to hurt you, but shouldn't you have known better not to get hurt by what they should have not known better to do? <laughs> Come on, man. Drop your attitude. It's twisted. What happens is we get that offense, and then all of a sudden we go from church to church to church looking for love instead of becoming love and plugging in. It's the truth. Drop that stuff, man. It's binding you and holding you back. It's destroying you. So we get married. I walk out, beautiful bride. We didn't have a honeymoon. Every day is a honeymoon, man. We didn't have any money. I want to get a job. It's awesome. Here's what happened. The day after my marriage, after we got married, I heard in my heart to go and visit Bobby. Because Bobby's in a coma. He didn't die, but he's brain dead. And they have him alive on machines. And I heard in my heart, he's not going to be alive tomorrow go and see him. So I went up to the brethren home where he was at and they had cut away his skull and his brain was out to here and I went in there and it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life ever. And I went in and his wife is in there she's not a Christian and I looked at her and I said I'm sorry Betty. She goes for what? I said because I, I didn't represent Jesus. She goes Jesus? Jesus, really? Look at my husband. And I said, I'm sorry. She goes, shut up. She walked into the corner and she bawled. And I looked at my friend who is dying, who's in a coma. I don't understand healing. All I know 
is that for five and a half months, I was the only guy that could have spoke to him. I was the only guy that he really talked to. I was his only friend, but I played the harlot. The hypocrite in front of my best friend. And now he sits there, stone cold face, not even home. I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry, but he can't hear me. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, man. And for 30 seconds, all of my hypocrisy passed before me. It was the craziest thing. Everything that, getting high, partying, amen, Jesus loves you, hate the church. 30 seconds, it was condemnation. It was hell. 30 seconds. It was hell. And God took it from me. Took it from me. I said, I'm sorry, man. I love you, man. He's real. If you can hear me, man, he's real. Pray with me, man. And he couldn't. He wasn't home. It, it did something here. It did something to me. It seared my heart, man. I left. My daughter, Destiny, my seven and a half year old daughter was with me. She looked at Bobby. She knew Bobby. She looked at him and she watched her father say how sorry he was for the hypocrite that he played. She didn't remember any of it. But she looked at Bobby and he died the next morning. <laughs> Life is short, man. <laughs> there are people that know you that aren't Christians. Let me ask you something. <laughs> Do they see it in you? Do they see it in you? Do you walk out the gospel? Do they see Christ in you? Do you walk out hypocrisy? Do you just, whatever? Life is short, you're here to leave a legacy. And my buddy died, and his wife called me the next day. And to make matters worse, she said, you were Bobby's only friend. We're, we're gonna do his funeral in three days. We want you to speak at it. No Christians. They, they have someone, a man that has a, a license that can do the funeral. So I go there, man, and I, I, the night before, I'm, I'm a total wreck, man. My, my, my wife, she knows Bobby. She knows the hypocrisy that I played. My wife has never brought up who I was, ever, not once. But she knows my heart. She knows that it's pure and clean. She knows that that's not me. So I go to the funeral home, and Bobby's in the casket. <laughs> He's in the casket. He's behind me. And I go up there, and the night before, God gave me a poem to write. I wrote a poem about what a friend is. And I, I stand before his kids, two of them, and Bobby's here. I stand before kids that go up to a coffin and say, Daddy, Daddy, wake up. Daddy, wake up. <laughs> Dude, that's horrible. This guy was my best friend. My heart is cut, man. It is totally cut. And I shared what it meant to be a friend. A friend walks out the truth. A friend stands by what he believes. A friend lays down his life. A true friend. And I confessed Jesus to this man. But I had nothing to back it up. So he didn't see it in me. And the last words, I told his kids, the last words out of your dad's mouth, because that day that I left the Teen Challenge, that morning, I left a message on his phone. That morning that I left, he had the aneurysm. That day. I said, when I called, when I talked to your father the last time, he looked at, he looked at me. And he said, Todd, I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in you. And I looked at the kids and I said, I don't know where your daddy is. Because there's only one name. His name is Jesus. And I'm sorry that I didn't walk this out. The kids looked at me with a stone cold face, man. Their daddy's not there. And I said, there's only one of two places that we go and we die, guys. Heaven or hell. And I was broken. Broken. Because I was a hypocrite. And because of my hypocrisy, I'm not guilty, I'm not ashamed, and I'm not condemned. 
But I am convicted that because of my hypocrisy, that man had a chance to see who Jesus was, and I did not walk it out. Life is short. You are here to leave a legacy. This is not a bless me club. God wants to bless us with every spiritual blessing. We have it all. But let's not get it confused and just be in it for what we can get from Him. We need to fully and completely give our lives to the King. There are people dying every day. Let me ask you this. How's your walk? Where's your walk at? Where's your walk? Do people around you, do they believe that you believe what you say you believe? Or do you walk out something different? When people make fun of somebody at your workplace, do you laugh right along with them and blend right in? Or do you look different? When someone's making fun of somebody, do you just join in with their little reindeer games? Or do you take a stand? When you're in a line and you're at the grocery store and people are complaining about the cashier because she's having a hard day, do you say, yeah, they should have somebody else on here? Or do you stand up and say, hey, you know what? She really needs grace. What do you say we pray for her right now? That's how I live my life, man. I'm not going out that way. I'm not. I live with a burning, passionate desire that every day I'm going to walk out this gospel. And nobody, nobody that encounters my life is going to have any doubt that Jesus is real. Nobody. The gospel shouldn't be known just by its doctrine. It should be known by its passionate heart cry. It should be known by a burning desire for people around you to know Him. It should be known as a people that have no hypocrisy, no compromise, because they've submitted to God, they've given themselves completely to God. 100%. I need the worship team up here, please. I love you, but I won't water down this thing for nobody. I've been in your town for a couple of days. I've watched a bunch of people come to Jesus. Everywhere I go, it doesn't matter. Drugstore tonight, I went in there. I said, how you doing? I had to get some eye drops because I've been crying a lot. I said, how you doing? She goes, oh, my day's so long. I went and got my stuff. I came back up. I said, give me your hands, honey. She goes, okay. I grabbed her hands. She starts trembling. I said, God loves you so much. She goes, thank you. We have something to give the world. Why would you hold it back for any longer? Why would you dare to hold on to you? Why wouldn't you just give yourself completely to this thing, man? Jesus is amazing. He paid a price for us to have an abundant life. He paid a price for us to not just get to heaven, but to have heaven flowing through us so that we could stomp hell for a living. He didn't pay a price for us to play the hypocrite, to play the harlot. Hot or cold? Hot or cold? Choose one. Don't be warm. Burn with passion. Be fiery about this thing. Don't sit back and hold Jesus back. Don't go to your family reunions and be too ashamed to mention the name of Jesus. Everywhere I go, I get to give this to people. I'm going to be locked in a steel tube at 36,000 feet tomorrow on a plane with people that need to know what I have. And I won't be silent about it. I'm consumed with the passionate fire of heaven. Would you not want to be that? I would ask you this day, church. I love you. Rayma has an amazing, an amazing testimony around the world. Amazing. Doesn't matter. Each individual is responsible to walk out their Christianity. So I would ask you this, guys. All of you have a Bobby in your life, man. Somebody that doesn't know God. Are you living and walking in such a way where they're going to know? Are you compromising this thing? Are you trying to like 007 Christianity, a secret mission? Is it a private matter? Well, it's private. I don't like to talk about that in public. Nonsense, man. Take the basket off your head and run with Jesus. We're going to play a song. It's called For the Sake of the World. Because that's what it's about. It's about burn like a fire in me for the sake of the world. I'm going to ask you, you came here, and you don't know Jesus. I want you up here right now, and I don't want you to hold on to you anymore. There are people that are dying every day. If you don't know him, please come down here. Do not be afraid. 
please come down here now. How dare you hold on to you anymore? If you don't know Jesus, I need you down here. My God. If you don't know Jesus, I would love to introduce him to you. I've preached my heart out tonight, man. I've shared my testimony. I share it all the time. But it's not so I can impress you. It's so I can impregnate you with the truth of the gospel. Is there anybody that would be bold enough to say, you know what? I've never given myself to Jesus, but I'm, I'm all in. Come on, get down here. Come on. Listen, stop sitting. If that's you, get up here. Champion. Come on. Come down here. I challenge you, church. If you don't know Jesus, come down here right now. Stop holding on to you. You will not make it. You say, well, this is an aggressive altar call. That's because Jesus is aggressive. That's because that's what love is. Come on. I'm going to start pointing out people. I don't want to, but I'm going to start pointing you out. I need you to get down here. Listen, your heart is going like this because it's you. Get down here. Don't you want to let go of that anger? Don't you want to let go of that hatred? What are you doing? Some of you sat out there and were angry at me because I'm talking this way. I'd rather tell you now than you to stand before the king one day and realize that your life was a wash, man. Jesus. Jesus. Precious Jesus, you reign in here. Man, there are more of you. Why would you hold back? If you're up there, I need you down here. Jesus, precious Jesus. four people that were bold enough to come up here and I've got people that are afraid that won't let guilt hold you in a seat I don't want anybody to know I've been playing Christian I know what I'm hearing in my heart man so God is going to mark this church the hypocrisy is not going to be a part of it. Bless you, champion. Bless you, man. Love you. Love you. It's okay. Listen, where's the microphone? Turn this on, please. Is it on? Good man. Say what you just said. I met Jesus before, but I want to meet it again. That's right. That was what I was going to say. If you're in this church, and you've been living in a life of hypocrisy, you've been living halfway, I promise you all the guilt, all the shame, all the condemnation is going to be crushed. I want you up here right now. Good man. Come on! Would you not run with me? Why would you hold on to you? It's time to run. Get up here. Anybody that that shoe fits, we're kicking them off today. Get up here right now. God is going to burn in you like a fire. 
and all the people that were affected with hypocrisy, that thing's going to be wiped out in their minds. Just like my daughter. If your parents, if you're here, parents, and you've done this thing and you can't forgive yourself because of how you've walked in front of your kids, come up here and get clean from that thing right now. Jesus, come on. Man, I wish there was more people that would be bold about this thing. Why would you want to hold on to you? Proud of you guys. I promise you this. I promise freedom. It's time that Ramah is known as a church that burns with fiery intimacy. With the word so solid that it's unshakable. That people come to Jesus everywhere we walk. Come on guys. If that's you, I need you up here. For real. There's more. You guys can step forward a little bit. Or you can move forward to the line, I guess. Or wherever they, that line's there for something. Come on, Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you. In Jesus' name, if your heart is in that place, I'm not saying that you're a complete hypocrite. But I'm saying that you want that thing to be out of your life that's not going to be no more. And you're saying, I am full on. Full on! Amen. Holy Spirit's on you right now, bro. He loves you, man. He is taking all that trash out. You're going to burn with a clear flame, man. For real. All of it. All of it. I watch him wipe away addiction. He just says, see ya. That's what's happening right now, man. That fire that's inside of you, he's burning addiction out right now, man. It's good news, bro. There's no way out of it. He's shaking it out. Get out. Let him go now. Jesus. I curse and command addiction to go now. Jesus. Jesus. It's crazy sometimes I give these calls and people sit in their seat and say, well, you know, God can touch me here. That's not what I asked you to do. I'm not your commander, but he is. He's asked you to make a commitment. He's asked you to come forward. He's asked you to rise up, church. He's asked you not to play the harlot. He's asked you to run. You mix hunger with this thing being free, oh, it's explosive. Holy, holy, holy. 
sing it, you're free in this. Sing it. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Jesus, have your way in me. Again. Jesus, God. I thank you for all the people that came forward. God, I'm asking you to mark them right now in the name of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Come. Jesus. 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 Touch them, God. Touch them, God. Jesus' name. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Jesus. 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 You don't need my touch, trust me. It's going on. He's in the hearts. He's doing it. He's cleaning house. This is awesome. He's doing it. God does it. The word is truth. The word comes in and cuts it up and takes it out. Freedom. Jesus. Come on, God. More. I want you guys out there, body of Christ, come up here. Start laying hands on these people. Come touch them. Come on, guys. We're the church. I just want you to pray over them right now. Come on. Pray over them. Jesus. 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 Everybody, find somebody. Touch them. Get your hands on them. We're the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. The fullness of Him that fills all in all. Come on, guys. Howdy, man. Okay. Jesus, Jesus. You that are coming down, just don't come up here. Move in among them so that you're in. Get the ones up in the front. Come on. Move up in front. Everybody, push up in there. Let's, let's minister. Come on, guys. Find somebody to pray for right now. We're the body of Christ. Do it. Do it. Come on, Jesus. More. More, God. More. More, more, more. More, God. Come on, God. More. Touch your people, Jesus. Touch your people. Come on, guys. Find 
need somebody. I need you guys to get up front. Find some people. Lay hands on them. Pray your heart over them. Pray God's heart. Pray God's heart over them. Prophesy over them. Come on, guys. Really? They don't need me to touch them. I want you guys to come and help me. We're members of the body of Christ. Let's do it. Thank you. 
sing it with a completely different meaning we sang it earlier and it was cool but this is going to be different see because it's for the sake of the world that God would burn like a fire in us for every eye to see see when every eye sees us burning like fire as the body of Christ listen it talks very clearly it says that we shine in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation it says this in Isaiah 60, Arise and shine, for your light has come. Has come. We are the light of the world. We are a city on a hill. We are. We are as the body of Christ. So we're going to sing this song a bunch of times, if you guys are willing to. We're going to worship Jesus with all of our heart, with all of our strength, and all of our soul for the sake of the world, okay? Are you ready? Yes. We're gonna sing it with this brand new perspective. We did this last night, it was crazy, awesome. It's so gonna do the same thing right here. We're gonna leave this meeting tonight completely different. I promise this, when you wake up in the morning, who here has been here for the last couple days? What has it been like your next morning? Crazy, right? Crazy, it's awesome, brand new. Like, brand new, man, brand new. Everybody here is going to get that. Everybody. Everybody. You're going to wake up with a brand new perspective on why you're alive. You're alive to represent heaven on earth. Amen? So let's sing this with everything we are. I'm laying down my life. I'm giving up control. I'm giving up control. Come on.
a song man
You know, this is what I've been praying for. We've gotten in the church world where we make confessions, but there's nothing down here. It's empty. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? You know, some people ask me, they say, every time you preach, you give an altar call. I don't want to stand before Jesus and him say, somebody went to hell because I didn't give him a chance to get saved. I don't want to stand. And they say, because you had words, but not a lifestyle. You never spoke to somebody. They went to hell because you didn't have that fire burning in you. You know, the Word of God talks about a king, the king of Israel, by the name of Saul, that was anointed by the power of God. But he turned his back on it. And his last words were, I played the fool. I varied exceedingly. And he fell on his own sword and took his own life. He had his fingertips on glory. And he turned it loose. We've experienced the power of God in this place tonight vow in your heart right now that you'll never turn it loose. That you'll be that flame ever burning for God. And everywhere you go, look for an opportunity to demonstrate Jesus. Makes no difference where it is. Hang around with this man a while. You'll see him do it in the restaurant. You'll see him do it in the store, wherever. There's David Vasquez Jr. right there. His dad was a precious friend of mine. You couldn't go anywhere with David Vasquez Sr. You'd be standing around talking, you look around, where's David, where's David? He's over here, he's got somebody. And he's telling about Jesus. That's the way we all should be. One of my Rhema pastors right there, he said, he let just the cares of the world push, push it down. As preachers, we all, we have to stay, we have to stay on fire. He told you, I don't know how many times he said, I stay in the word, I stay in the word. It's staying in the word that will keep you going. You don't need another sermon from me but he got my evangelist stirred up in me. From, from the time I started preaching in 1958 till 1985, I was evangelist. And the Lord changed me into a pastor. I would preach hard and fast, you know. But hey, let's everybody find a seat. We want to we give Todd a good offering so he can go somewhere else and preach the same gospel. I know that in just a few weeks that he is going to go do a big crusade with Reinhard Bonnke. And I, I know it takes money to go overseas. It takes money to fly around the country. He has to, he's got a family. He, he didn't finish and tell you that he's got uh, two more daughters. Uh, yeah, you got, you got two more daughters now, right? Todd? You got three daughters now. You got the one that's seven. 17, 17 seven, and two and a half. Yeah. Oh. Hallelujah. Hey. Praise God. Yes. If you want to text your message, right there it is. Guest. Space the amount, 28950. Follow the prompts on the screen. All you Raymond people already know how to do it. Hey, did you get anything tonight? Was anybody stirred up again? 
bring you back to whenever you find Jesus the first time yourself. Right? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man, I tell you what. You know, he, he, he looked down there and we just took that. We just, we, and we took, did you notice they took that, uh, that clock down back there? Todd? <laughs> did you notice? Thank you for helping me taking the clock down for me. Thank you. I did see it. I looked up there and it was not there. It's just like heaven. He said it on earth as it is in heaven. There's no time clocks there. That's right. You know, he looked at me and I shook my head. Go, go, go. Uh, how many of you, there wasn't any of you ready for him to stop, was he? Back there then. He, no, praise God. I tell you what, I, I want us to have a, a good offering now. Is everybody ready? Let's, you pray over your own offering. I'll pray here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Todd. I thank you for what you've done in his life. And Father, we, we, we give this offering now so that he can continue to tell people about Jesus. It takes money to travel. It takes money to live in this world that we live in, and you can supply it, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. If you're, making, if you're going to make out a check, just make it to Raymond. We'll give him one, one, one check. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My wife's got, but I always give. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Whew. Man, it was so thrilling to see all of you down here. And I, of course, I was on the fringes there watching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But it's real easy if you're not careful for this to just be a one-night experience. Huh? Yes, yes. It's real easy for you to get out there and to turn it loose. Man, keep yourself every day. Get up every morning and declare that this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Ask the Lord every day, send somebody across your path that you can minister to. Send somebody across your path that you can minister to. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, as soon as they get this offering taken, Todd has asked us to, to pray for him as God's opening more and more doors for him and he wants to be able to follow the will of God for his life. So you come on, Todd, Lynette, come here with me. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. Y'all all stand up and reach your hands out here and you pray. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Todd and his ministry. Father, you have done such a real thing for him. He is so turned on for you. I pray that the anointing of the power of God will be more real to him than, he, than it's ever been. I thank you that you'll open doors that he can speak in places that other people would never have an opportunity to. And Father, I thank you that that anointing is upon him. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, never the same again after tonight. Never the same again after tonight. Oh, Prakini Namoshi, Marikasa. Yeah, it will be. It will be in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You didn't need to know what I said anyway. Hallelujah to Jesus. Bless you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Raise your hands and just give God the glory. One more time. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Turn around and shake hands with somebody and say, I don't know about you, but I'm going to burn for God. God bless you. We'll see you. If you're a visitor, thank you for being here. And we invite you just to come back and be a part of us. God bless.